my name is Dr. Kyle Treiber. I'm a lecturer in neurocriminology at the University of Cambridge, and it's my pleasure to be able to interview my colleague, Professor Per Olaf Fickstrom, which I refer to as PO much more familiarly. He is Professor of Ecological and Developmental Criminology, also at the University of Cambridge. He's also the director there for the Centre of Analytic Criminology, and he's the principal investigator of the Peterborough Adolescent and Young Adult Development Study, known as PADS Plus, which I'm sure we'll be hearing about a little bit later today. He's internationally acknowledged. Um, he has re received the Cell and Gluck Award for his contributions to international criminology, something which we'll highlight. He has been uh, awarded the Stockholm Prize for his contributions to criminological research. He's a fellow for the Center of Advanced Study of Behavioral Sciences in Stanford. He's also a fellow of the American Society of Criminology and a fellow of the British Academy. His contributions to criminology, I feel, can be characterized by the concept of integration. And so that's how I want to try to capture this interview, um, using that theme of integration across looking at his, uh, his history and his experience of criminology, which he's going to share with us today. So this includes the integration of knowledge, both knowledge that's relevant to, um, as well as specific to criminology, and also the integration of criminologists themselves, so bringing together criminologists um, from across the world, but also especially from Europe. He also has then taken this integration of knowledge and drawn from that key insights and integrated those, in particular, integrated insights across individual and environmental perspectives in criminology, which have traditionally been kept separate. <coughs> he also has moved beyond that to integrate theory building with theory testing, something that's at the core of his uh, perspective of analytic criminology, which is something that he has been putting forward in very recent years. And finally, he has also been involved in integrating cross-national research as part of this theory testing, um, and then looking at the implications of this broad area of knowledge that he's helped bring together and also helped to create um, in terms of understanding the implications for explanation of crime as well as crime prevention. So I'm going to start off actually with mm -hmm. just a little brief uh, press say of how P.O. has actually integrated his work with that of an American neuropsychologist, that would be myself, um, so that it's understood where our um, relationship lies. Um, I came to Cambridge in 2002, um, as I mentioned, uh, having studied neuropsychology, so I was very interested in criminal psychology and the roots of criminal behaviour. But I found, actually, it was very difficult to transition from the natural sciences into social sciences. And I think now, looking back and having had um, the perspective of my work with PO, I can understand that now because I was very interested in action mechanisms. I was interested in theory testing. These were things that I had, had connected with in my own studies um, in the more natural sciences. And I didn't find a home for them in criminology. And so um, I was very lucky, I think, to be in the right place at the right time where PO was bringing this into criminology and making this the focus, again, of his analytic criminology. So I was very lucky to join the PADS plus study, which has been mentioned, um, and I've now been with that study for the past almost 20 years. So the rest is effectively history. We are, of course, most interested in PO's history, however, so that's where we're going to turn now. I mentioned about structuring this around the idea of integration, um, and so I have somewhat artificially segmented some of my thinking around the different periods that I'm familiar with in PO's life, and the focus of integration that he was involved in in his periods. So the first period is the period that he spent in Sweden before I ever um, was uh, introduced to him. And this is a period where he was um, beginning his forays into criminology and integrating knowledge, um, both interdisciplinary knowledge, bringing together ideas from various disciplines, and I'm sure Pia, you can say uh, a lot about mm -hmm. your background, which is very broad across different subjects. Um, and also international, where he was doing quite a lot to bring together criminologists and their ideas from around the world. So can you please tell us first about this period of your life in Sweden and how you were integrating this interdisciplinary knowledge and bringing together criminologists internationally? Okay. <clears throat> first of all, thank you for this uh, wonderful introduction uh, uh, and so on. So, uh, well, uh, I started in criminology in... Uh, the mid 70s and, and so on and the, the first um, focus of my studies were ecology. I did large studies on uh, particular violence, urban ecology and so on. So that was a major focus. I spent I think um, oh, 
uh, years in, in police cellars, coding police uh, records. That I think I personally coded between seven and nine thousand, I can't remember, uh, police files. But the focus was on trying to find out the situation uh, in, in terms of that looking at who was assaulting whom, in what kind of circumstances, and also they called it in whereabout in various cities uh, that was living. So that was sort of my first encounter with uh, uh, criminology. Uh, after a while I became also interested in individual differences. So uh, I started to work, there was a huge longitudinal study in, in Stockholm called Project Metropolitan that followed 15,000 um, young people. Uh, so I did some work on that uh, particular. So that's my first major uh, research points. And I think, is, as you were alluding to integration, that this was the starting of thinking, okay, we have this ecological tradition and we had this individual development tradition, but really they did not work together. It was almost like two tribes. People who worked in ecology and people who worked in, in... And it was very difficult to find theories that um, bridge the two and so on. So I, I guess my interest in integration started with these kind of experiences. During that time, I believe, um you had some experience with um, other international criminologists, so you were, mm -hmm. uh, am I correct that you were working with Ralph Loeber on the mm -hmm. uh, Pittsburgh study, so you had experience mm -hmm. with that, David Farrington doing cross-national search, mm -hmm. so this is all feeding into your thinking and development of your, your plan. Yeah, that, that, that was very important, I mean I was lucky enough to work with uh, some of the best people in the field and so on, and w which is really good when you're a young scholar because you can learn a lot and so on. So I think uh, with the Pittsburgh study, I uh, was working with the ecology, trying to, I mean, that's a fantastic study, study and it actually studied that we have modeled our study, but we'll perhaps talk about later uh, from that, but they lacked an ecological component. So that was something that, that I tried to contribute to that one. And with David, we did, I did some cross-national comparison, comparing his, Cambridge study with data from the Pro Project Metropolitan study, so yeah. And at that time you were also working with the um, Swedish Crime Prevention Council and that was where you set up some international conferences and journals, can you tell about yeah, that? Yeah, that, that was the, uh, spent the first 10 years at the University of Stockholm basically doing research and then I was uh, um, asked to take up a job at the um, Swedish National Crime Prevention Council <clears throat> and here the focus was still a lot of ecology, we did a lot of research in something called the Stockholm Project, which included an intense study of eight neighborhoods in, in, in Stockholm, but we also did a lot of um, pilot projects trying to develop localized crime prevention <clears throat> and so on, in a sense. So we, I, th I think we built a, a quite strong research unit. And we also tried, given that Sweden is a small country, the, the, the main strategy I had was to try to uh, get a lot of collaborations internationally. We arranged several conferences, we invited people, we did one on the integration of individual and ecological aspects, which came out in a book which I co-authored with um, uh, David Farrington and Rob Sampson. Then we did one on integrating crime prevention strategies, which um, uh, Ron Clark and, <coughs> and you, McCord, uh, was uh, the other editors and so on. So we tried to capitalize on, on, on uh, internet, building international links. Uh, also star started a journal, uh, which was called, I think it was called Studies in Crime and Crime Prevention in, in the English Journal. Um, and that also survived for some uh, time and then it was, I think, amalgamated into the, with another journal called Scandinavian Studies and they became one and uh, I can't even remember what it's called now, but there is one journal for that. So it was a lot of activity and I, I think this is important because um, the first 10 years just spending doing research but this also gave focus on the practical utility of research and, and so on by working with a lot with practitioners and so on. 
and that's something I have been continued with, um, yeah, basically ever since, always trying to do fundamental research, but also work with policy and practice implications. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to that towards the end as well. So I'm just curious, with you talking now about bringing those international players mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. you moved from Sweden to the UK around um, 2000, a few years before that, and so 97. 97. <laughs> so that's, I'm thinking about the the, um, mm -hmm. the initiation of the the ESC, the European Society of Criminology, mm -hmm. which should have been somewhere around mm -hmm. in that time frame. Um, how does that fit in to the work that you were doing already in Sweden, bringing together people? What was your role and your experience of that? Mm -hmm. Well, the European Society, I mean, I mean, I was always very interested in, in, in the, the creation of such a society. I remember somewhere in the mid, I think it was mid-90s, uh, you see Jung Tass was on a meeting in, in Stockholm and we discussed this and then as, as you know things happened and slowly and then I moved to Cambridge and then uh, also talked with Michael Turner about this and then a lot of people and then eventually uh, we had a meeting or several meetings and then it, it emerged and so on and I, I think the it's really important to have a European society and one reason I thought at that point is that all countries had their, in Europe had their own criminological society. So there was well, there was a Scandinavian, a British, etc., and so on. And but they were all pretty small and didn't have much interaction and, and so on. And there's a lot of good criminology going on, or in in Europe, but wasn't really showcased well. So in. I thought the European society would be excellent for uh, for that particular reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is around the time period then that you're moving to Cambridge mm -hmm. um, and, and to the, the Institute of Criminology where you're now uh, located. Um, again, as I try to make sense of the, of the story here, I see that period as a time where all of this knowledge that you're bringing together, the interdisciplinary knowledge, the intradisciplinary knowledge, and the knowledge um, from all of those international players is coming together into an integration of the key insights. And one of the things that you're writing really highlights is the integration of the individual and the environmental perspectives mm -hmm. you just mentioned about having put together conferences that are mm -hmm. actually that are looking at that. So in this period of time, mm -hmm. you were at the beginning of developing your situational action theory, which mm -hmm. is the key theory that, that guides mm -hmm. your research at the moment. And also mm -hmm. then you undertook the first test of that which also developed some of the key methodologies that you use. So can you tell us about that period, about the, the development of the situational action theory and also the well, I, 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 th I think there was a kind of, or I felt some kind of frustration working with sort of individual differences in development and the ecology, um, that there were really no good theory that could bridge the, the, the personal environment. Um, so initially I tried to see, okay, can you which others have done combined routine activities, social disorganization with um, individual level theories and so on. But it didn't, I felt it didn't work really well. So it was first when I um, spent some time at the um, uh, Stanford Center, I became interested in, 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 in the familiar with action theory. Uh, and then it sort of, at least for me, clicked in the sense that action theory is probably the vehicle to integrate uh, person and, and environment. And the reason is that if, if, if you really understand what things move people to act in one way or another, um, you can then start to ask question, okay, what, what kind of individual differences, what kind of individual development is important for people's crime involvement? What environmental aspects are important? Because as you know, we have hundreds if not thousands um, of various factors and correlates in, in crime and most of them obviously are just markers and symptoms and so so, so really this uh, I find this a good starting point for trying to uh, uh, assess these kind of things. And so that led into the development of the situational action theory mm -hmm. as a framework for trying to put that information together. 
there's been interesting discussion of this mm. theory. It's received a lot of attention, especially from European criminologists, um, not just the theory itself, but also theory testing and mm -hmm. looking for support, which has been very exciting, obviously, for, for those of us who are working with that particular theory. But there are those out there who have suggested that it isn't different than some mm. theories like the control theories or routine, or rational choice theory um, or routine activity theory. So how would you try to explain well, that, uh, the I think that's quite good because people say that all the... the this is a control theory, this is a routine theory, this is a threat. Which is really good because then I, th I think it's, it's, it's a good indication that the, the purpose is accomplished. That one actually, and that was one of the aim to integrate key in, uh, insights from all these various theories. But again, the vehicle was the action theory, and, and most criminological theories do not really have a good action theory uh, in a sense, or, or some eludes and so. Um, so by doing that and also capitalizing by findings more broadly from social and behavior science, um, I, th I think this was um, sort of a good way to, uh, to actually get it together. And then we moved on, uh, as, you, as I think you were start to um, alluding to that, okay, a theory is a theory. But you also need to test the theory because I mean there's a lot of theory. I mean one of the problems, I guess, with disciplines like criminology is we have so many theories and textbooks or a cookbook. You, uh, as if you could choose any theory you like, rather. So the important thing is, and I'm obviously not the only one has pointed this out. It's really to testing. So that led to started to do. Um, um, research programs that was specifically designed to test and to do that you need to have money. I, I remember the first grant we got was a small grant from uh, um, the Home Office. We did the, um, just a cross-sectional study in Peterborough. Uh, but the main, I, I, th I think, good thing with that study was it enabled us to develop what we later have used quite a lot, so a uh, space-time budget methodology, which means that you follow people hour for hour, so you really can tie the person to the environment and to their actions, and so on. This was a test uh, period. And then later we were uh, lucky to get bigger grants, because um, if I remember corre correctly, we got a big grant for something called Scopic, um, and the idea with Scopic was to bring together the, some of the leading researchers in ecology and uh, individual development, but not only, as we've done before, have conferences and discussions, but also actually do research. So that was the first funding of our, our study, which you have been involved in, the PADS Plus study, but also Tony Bottom's Sheffield study, and we also contributed um, some money to add on, I think, an ecological aspect to Tammy Muffet's um, twin study uh, in, in, in London. So uh, we moved from just sort of being theoretical and, and trying to integrate also to trying to transform it in, into uh, research. So that was yeah, the next step. Yeah, so that, that leads me straight into the next period of, of time, which is the time when you were developing, in particular, the, the Peter Bradless and a young adult development study, PADS Plus, which you mm -hmm. mentioned there was one of these four studies in that initial scopic network, social context of pathways in crime. I believe that, mm. that's just more if I can remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so in that time, this is really the, through PADS Plus, which is, of course, an ongoing longitudinal study. Um, yeah. it's, it's been carrying on since the, the original wave in 2003 with the parents, and then I joined the study in 2004 when mm -hmm. the young people were, were first interviewed, um, so for, for quite uh, many years. Um, one of the things that, that I, working with this study mm -hmm. myself, find really, mm -hmm. really fascinating um, and is an element of integration is that the first steps were looking at the situational process. You talked yeah. about action theories, so being able to look at people and environments interacting in a moment mm -hmm. of action, mm -hmm. but then with the longitudinal study you were able yeah. to integrate that mm -hmm. experience you had, which you've already mentioned longitudinally, mm -hmm. um, for example with the Pittsburgh study, mm -hmm. with this situational model as well to then address developmental processes mm -hmm. and combine this ecological approach in a longitudinal frame. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about the contribution that that, 
that that makes. You've mentioned about gaps that are, are missing um, in, in phenological knowledge. Uh, well, I, it's, it's, I, I think, um, I mean, people can differ in what they think are important and not important, but um, again, I, I think developing this, uh, um, the framework, and also trying to develop a methodology that we actually can test the framework uh, has been quite a useful uh, combination. And so far, I, I think the most of the tests we have done has been very supportive with the, the, come the situation model, uh, ecology of crime. I mean, it is easy with this model to explain um, hotspots, um, changes over time, uh, which as you know, we currently finish a book on, uh, working on. So that's, uh, that's quite a lot of uh, different things. Uh, one of the methodologies, you mm -hmm. mentioned the space time budget, which mm -hmm. is a very important advance to be able to measure people's actual exposure in mm -hmm. their, in their um, activity spaces. Mm -hmm. Now with Empowered Plus, unlike mm -hmm. the original mm -hmm. Peter Rainey mm -hmm. study, that's combined with a community survey yeah. as well. So you have this really specific mm -hmm. and unique measures of the social ecology of the city of Peterborough where the young people are being mapped out and can link that in. Um, I'm thinking about the the scope of that project. So you've got the space time budget to actually map where people are going. You've got a community survey to look at the areas that they're spending yeah. time in, which you can map by the space time budget. Then obviously you have the individual level mm -hmm. variables, um, which you mentioned about mm -hmm. the influence of the Pittsburgh youth study. Uh, I know a lot of that has come from there mm -hmm. to be able to measure those young people. Mm -hmm. There's also, I know, other elements that I've been involved in, the, the mm -hmm. neuropsychological and cognitive mm -hmm. tasks, and then um, even genetics. Um, what are the challenges that, that you encountered, that your research team encountered on the way? Is there anything in particular that... Well, there's a lot, I mean, no research is perfect, so it, it's, it's a lifelong project to try to make it better and better, and that's what we're working for, try to add. So, so I guess the two elements to that, um, one element is uh, you need to find financing, because to do good research costs money, uh, and so on. And, and secondly, also to find out the ideas how we actually do this and so on, which is not always possible in, in, in social sciences. Uh, but what we, what we try to do is, is um, to combine, and I think, I, th I think a lot of the, you were talking about the space-time budget methodology and so on, was actually inspired of the early Chicago school. Uh, they were basic, very basic in the research. Ba they looked at uh, variations often in, in um, official statistics and so on. But a lot of the reasoning and, and so on, the problems are okay. So if you have neighborhoods and so on, we know for instance that people who live in the same neighborhood can live very different lives, but it's very difficult to capture that and that could ex uh, explain. But with a methodology like the space-time budget, we can actually study how people actually in the same house live their lives and what consequences that have for, for it. And again, I, th I think it's important, but, get, but uh, I guess there's some resistance to talk about these old tribes of, I guess, more sociologically, more psychologically oriented to actually bring this together because I think there has been a lot of unnecessary competition and conflict and really t to move um, our understanding of these problems uh, it's the bringing of, of the insights together in, the, in an effective way but that, that that's a huge project and we I, th I think we are only in the starting points of uh, of doing that one of the real strengths of the Pads Plus study um, which is evidenced by the publications that have come out from the study itself, but also by the number of studies that are now replicating the methodology really effectively, mm -hmm. um, is the quality of the data. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the space time budget and the fact that we can actually map movements and incredibly detailed yeah. data about exposure. And just as you mentioned, mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. try to then distinguish how mm -hmm. people who live in the same neighborhood actually differ from each other in mm -hmm. their exposure and, and, and how they respond to that exposure. Um, but one of the things I know that comes up a lot in, in descriptions of the study is, for mm. example, the high retention rate. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the fact that we're able to get as large a sample in the community mm. survey as possible. Mm -hmm. um, what are your insights into having well, that kind it, of it, success? It, it, as, as I said, we, we, having had the benefit in, in working with um, Rolf Lober and, and the Pittsburgh Youth Study, 
which is an extremely well organized and run study. So when we started the PALS Plus study, we sent the, the person who was then the research man manager over to Pittsburgh to study actually how they do it and so on. And, and we learned a lot how to uh, make people want to take part in the study, how you keep people and, and the, the, the various techniques, which, which is really important because obviously if you have a longitudinal study and if you lose people, um, and, and, and most longitudinal studies do that, um, that could affect the findings over time. And particularly, uh, I, th I think we have been good on keeping people uh, who are heavily involved in crime, which is often the, the, the people that, that is, um, you lose a lot. And, and so that is particularly, uh, I think, good point with the past past study. Mm, it's 92% retention rate over mm -hmm. 16 years of study, so it's very, very impressive. Um, okay, so then moving on from specifically the PADS Plus study, the next phase is really where you are now um, in, in your research. Mm -hmm. um, obviously the PADS Plus study is, is ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, the young people within that study are now entering young adulthood. So it's interesting to think about what the new aspects mm -hmm. um, that you'll be looking at are. Um, but also, within this time period, you've been very active in building up this, this network of mm -hmm. international researchers who are also studying um, the situation action theory and mm. testing it within different national and international contexts. Um, and then the other aspect at the moment that you're developing um, is implications for explaining and preventing crime from these various mm -hmm. studies and of course from the main bulk of, of, mm -hmm. of the Pan Spa study. So you can, can you say something a little bit about the inspiration or the, um, the nature of that work both across national and inter, inter um, Well it is, it, it is, we, we, we have built and we, we, we basically which is, uh, I think, uh, when we are in the uh, in European society, we, we have really, I think, built a strong network with um, European colleagues and, and so on. So we, over the last um, six, seven years, we have run workshops in Cambridge where we brought together people who are interested in issues like this and, the, and, and uh, develop research and try to um, foster collaborations, cross-national comparisons and so on. And, and I know you and, and others are now involved in the project to try to assemble all these data sets because I think we have data sets from everything from China to Latin America to yeah, Europe of course. And that's really interesting because if you want to test the generality of theory, cross-national research is, is very important. And it's very rare, and it's very rare, I think, with cross-national research that use the same methodology and so on in, in various, so that's uh, a quite important uh, future part. When it comes to prevention, we did, uh, obviously have um, worked some with the Home Office, with other kinds of this, and, and when it comes to our findings, but we also uh, uh, have a, a localized projects. We have um, one project in Denmark we've been involved for a number of years to try to to uh, transform this kind of findings into something practical to use particularly long-term uh, uh, prevention and so on uh, and how, how you build that. There's a lot of prevention uh, when you look at localized prevention is focused on situational here and now policing situational and so on but what some people call social prevention, or developmental prevention, or how do you actually uh, manage that has been less uh, well catered for, I think. So that is looking at now yeah. the evolution or your experiences across mm -hmm. your um, life mm -hmm. course mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. with criminology. What are your observations or, or insights and thinking about how criminology has changed from when you mm -hmm. first entered the discipline to where we are now? Well, one thing is the expansion. It's, it's enormously, I mean, the, when I started it was one criminology department in Sweden, I don't know how many there are, 15, 20 or something. The, they have the same, uh, so the uh, same in the UK, uh, a lot of expansion. 
And unfortunately, I think on the downside, there are less focus now on more fundamental questions. The, 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 the ones we try to do sort of basic questions of um, the crime causation and so on, which I think is important for all things policy and so on, because if you clearly know, uh, have good ideas, why people commit crimes, what role people and environments play and so on, it's important not only for how you view the crimes, but the people, but also for how you um, design the best possible uh, preventions. So, so there's a lot of criminal justice focus now in, in criminology, which is, which is fine in itself. But I, I think the balance uh, could be better and, and so on that perhaps... Um, and you can see that as, as uh, if you go to conferences like the ESC and also the AEC that a lot of the topics are around prisons, policing, uh, criminal justice topics and so on less uh, sort of on, on, on more fundamental and that I think would be good good to strengthen that part of but that's obviously my highly personal view. Okay, so what do you see then for yourself uh, moving forward in criminology? You mean retiring soon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no, I, 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 th I think, I, I mean I hope we, the, that the study can continue because there are very few studies actually in in uh, the UK. The, I think there are only two modern longitudinal studies: is ours and the Edinburgh Project, and the England Wales is only one. Then we have David's study, who has been, the, but that's from 1953 cohort. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, to continue the study and, and people like yourself and 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 the other uh, uh, people in our team that you will take it on and, and continue because that if you observe that has been a problem with a lot of longitudinal research that when the person originally started it retire or stop um, that then the study also dies and as you know it takes enormous effort and time to do longitudinal and I think it's going to be more and more difficult to get people to participate so the value might even be higher so that's I, th I think is one the important uh, thing for the future. Yeah, that makes me think of some of the challenges in the future. Um, mm. From my experience, as you just alluded to, make doing the kind of longitudinal, long-term mm -hmm. research that we do is becoming perhaps more and more difficult because of the funding resources as well as some of the changes mm -hmm. in how people approach research and thinking in the yeah. terms of participation in research mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. much as, as researchers themselves. Mm -hmm. And yet there's this great potential with the technology that we yeah. now have available to us yeah. to make research much easier on a large scale and to make research methods and data collection much more smooth and potentially even more um, you, can, you, you can think about the space-time budget. I mean, I mean the, the first one we, we did was um, only sort of paper and pen and, and very manual. And, I mean, you, you could do a lot with modern technology now and, and study people's movements, patterns and so on, so that's... And also in, in terms of uh, experiments with virtual reality and so on, and testing sort of situational theories, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, things to happen. Um, I guess you asked about sort of the, the criminology thing. Uh, one thing that I think is a bit worrying, and people will disagree on this, is the tendency to mix up politics and activism with research uh, and so on. Nothing wrong with politics, nothing wrong with the activists, but I, I think it's a problem when uh, these get too much mixed and uh, in a sense and that's something which I personally think is is clear that that's important to keep. Mm. So I think that speaks back to what you were saying about the need for more fundamental research within mm -hmm. criminology and the focus on that scientific endeavour to understand more about the phenomenon of crime itself that we can then take as a strong foundation moving forward to actually inform prevention based yeah, on the understanding I think, I think it's important that we as researchers, our job, I mean, if, if I guess politics is about how we would uh, like things to be, the research is more about trying to find out how things are 
and that's really important that the two uh, uh, sort of interchange but not uh, sort of collude each other so um, I, I think but I know there's a lot of different uh, views on this point but I, I really think it's important not to do this. Well I think clear evidence for the need of that is the fact that we haven't come up with an effective explanation of crime, we haven't come up with effective ways mm. to deal with crime mm. or with those people who have become involved in it. Mm. So until we are able to actually create effective explanations and effective mm -hmm. methods, prevention, criminal justice procedures and so on, then we obviously don't have those answers. So we need to keep looking and we need to keep asking those yeah. questions. But it's, 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 I guess it's a bit more problematic because you also have the issue of what is crime and what, what and so on because but that will be a long discussion because <laughs> um, in a sense you, you have to differentiate why people do crime and why certain things are crime and people might highly disagree, and people do disagree about that. But that's, that's, that's a whole other issue. It's quite fascinating to be mm. in a discipline that's still, mm -hmm. <laughs> from the inception of it to, to today, mm -hmm. asking questions about what mm -hmm. it is that we study. <laughs> um, all right, so I mean, those are my main, my main questions and things mm. of interest. Um, I thought I might summarize perhaps where we've, mm -hmm. where we've come through the interview. Um, so as I said at the very beginning, and as we've emphasized throughout, um, I've been very interested in how you have been an integrative force within mm -hmm. criminology and how integration has been at the core of, of what you have done throughout your, your, uh, your very extensive and successful life as a criminologist. Um, so that's included the integration of both interdisciplinary knowledge, so knowledge from outside of the field of criminology, as well as interdisciplinary knowledge inside, looking at, as we mentioned, those split mm -hmm. parts of the discipline that we're looking at environmental and individual mm -hmm. um, information separately. Mm -hmm. um, you've also integrated key insights then from this body of knowledge that, that, that you worked um, mm -hmm. to bring together, so that's looking at both knowledge mm -hmm. from theories and trying to integrate mm -hmm. um, the, the key insights from theories, also methodologically, mm -hmm. key insights from methods, how do we study people, mm -hmm. but how do we study environments, and as you mentioned with the space mm -hmm. and budget in particular, how do we actually place people in environments so we aren't just using a proxy environment, but we actually can, can try to measure the true environments that they're in, which is a fascinating innovation. I, I think you're saying that because sometimes people think about criminality and come across that as so oh, this is social policy and the sort of second rate uh, discipline and so on. But I, but I actually th think um, th there are very many good prospects for criminology. But first of all, it is or should inherently be uh, multidisciplinary because people come from a lot of different uh, uh, to bring together. It really addresses fundamental questions in society like problems of social order and so on. So, so it, 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 it is, in one sense, a very fundamental knowledge base and, and, and so on. So um, uh, I, th I think that's important to, ke to keep in mind but when I think about criminology and its prospects. It's actually the, the, the rules we have in society, why people follow and break rules, how people come to uh, encompass certain rules and so on. It's all basic and, uh, and classic problems of, of social and behavioral sciences and, and, and uh, bridging. I actually think the concept of rules, if you look, you can find that in um, uh, neurosciences, uh, we have basic rule following people, you can find it in social psychology, interest in rules, you can find it in sociology and so on. So, so th th there is a good scope for bringing all this interesting knowledge together within the realm of, of uh, criminology, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that I think a lot of your work speaks to. It speaks to the fact that we have this great body of knowledge mm -hmm. within criminology and, and that we can draw on from other behavioural sciences, mm -hmm. but there's a fragmentation there. Mm -hmm. And so from, from your, your publications and also as we've spoken here, you have seen that as, as a key thing that, that needed to be addressed, that this mm -hmm. fragmentation needed to, to be addressed through this integration, through integrating mm -hmm. knowledge that we have and drawing upon it, in, um, in particular I mentioned theory of methods, but also findings, the empirical evidence that we mm -hmm. have, an evidence-based um, foundation for then, as we've said, building forward to you know, explain crime and then being able to have that foundation for crime prevention practices. Yeah, but the pro problem is that the people by training 
I mean, if he, I mean, a lot of people, the criminology, come from biology, psychology, social psychology, sociology, political sciences, and have their particular training and, tra and focus on that, all producing interesting insights, but not really uh, integrating them, uh, and so on. So, so that's really uh, uh, what what I think would be sort of the next fantastic step if criminology can move more to integrate and, and, and use and capitalize on all these various strands and thinking and so on, but we'll see what's happened in the years to come. So the other step then, that is the thing that we, we've had coming out here in the mm. interview and again we see through your work is, is bringing together not just that knowledge but the people mm. who are producing mm -hmm. it. Um, as, as well as the methods that they've mm. developed in order to produce it. So mm. with your international network then, um, of criminologists and, and your influence in, in trying to help create these networks like the European Society of Criminology, um, and seeing that that was, that was so mm. a way forward, um, then, that, then that brings together mm -hmm. all of those skills um, and all of those unique perspectives that all the different individuals have. And with that ability to try to shape it into something that's not so fragmented then yeah the, in a sense we need the, the sort of a common knowledge so people can communicate over, over disciplinary boundaries so not get stuck in because there are many concepts that are similar in sociology psychology and so on but they're different but they, they capture similar things and, and so on so that's yeah well i think mm. my ultimate conclusion of that is i was very lucky to be able to as I mm -hmm. said before, being in the right place at the right time, so that, that mm -hmm. my interdisciplinary knowledge, which is not criminological, mm -hmm. could find a place within the discipline. And then um, for myself within the project, mm -hmm. I spent mm -hmm. 10 years learning about social ecology of crime, which mm -hmm. then I could integrate with my knowledge of the individual. And that was something I couldn't find footing with within mm -hmm. my uh, introduction to criminology, mm -hmm. apart from mm -hmm. working with you on the past Force project. Mm -hmm. so. Has been hugely beneficial to me, and hopefully it will be to to others. Also, been able to benefit from from that. <laughs>